Okay, hello, welcome to CMC Markets and this non-farm payrolls webinar with myself, Michael Houston and Colin Szynski, who's based in our Toronto office in Canada. Um, once again, I'm sure this is going to be a roller coaster ride, um, certainly given what we've seen so far this week. Um, the economic data continues to be rather mixed. And obviously, we've also had the intervention of the IMF, which has muddied the waters somewhat. But before I get started on all the nuts and bolts, I just have to do the obligatory risk warning, which um, I'm obliged to do by my compliance department. So if you could all digest that slowly but surely um, for both jurisdictions, both Canada, UK, and Ireland, and uh, then we can then we can crack on, which I am now about to do. So as I say, we've got 15 minutes to go. Um, my expectation, I think, with this, with respect to this, these, these payroll numbers, uh, I think they're starting to lose. I think they're starting to lose their effect because I think, irrespective of what the payrolls numbers are, I think markets are now probably more focused on the inflation picture and the prices picture and the wages picture. I don't know whether you have a different view on that, Colin, but when I look at these, these, these payrolls numbers and I look at the direction of travel with respect to the recent data, it doesn't fill me with confidence. If we look at this spreadsheet that I've got here, um, I don't know whether you guys can see this, but if you look at yes, this column, in this column here, we've got ADP. And since November last year, we've basically drifted lower, 284, 275, 220, 200, 171, 165. Now, we have seen a bit of a pickup in May of 201, but certainly I don't think by enough to suggest that we're seeing a significant turnaround in terms of jobs growth in the U.S. economy. If we look at the non-farm payrolls data, we can see that, again, we had a very big numbers in November and December, 423, 329. Then, obviously, the December number, which was posted in January, was 201. That's quite a big drop. And then we've really fluctuated, 264, 85, 223. You look at the unemployment rate, it's 5.4%. But it's fallen at the same time as the participation rate. The participation rate has also fallen from 62.9 to 62.7. So for me, even though the unemployment rate is lower, it's on a much lower participation rate, which makes me think that, you know, this, this recovery that we're seeing in the jobs market, it's, it's, it's not as clear cut as I think a lot of economists would like it to be. And certainly if you look at wage growth, that continues to remain weak. The, the Fed's consumption indicator, not the, the PCE indicator, is also very weak. And we saw that in the latest data that we saw out earlier this week. I think more importantly than that, this, for me, this is all about the price action. You can look at the data and you can dissect it to your heart's content. But I noticed a couple of very key things on the charts over the course of the past couple of months. And regular viewers of my videos will know I talked about this at the beginning of May, just before the UK general election. Potential reversals on euro dollar and cable. If we look at the monthly chart here, we can see right here a potentially bullish engulfing or a key reversal day on the daily candle chart for euro dollar and to a lesser extent the pound against the dollar, which suggests to me that we've seen the peaks in the dollar. We can, extrapolate, we can also extrapolate that backwards in the context of the dollar index. So if we look at the dollar index in this particular chart that I've got here, again, hopefully you guys can see all of this. This is the decline from the peaks that we saw at the beginning of April to the lows, the double bottom, that we saw at the beginning of May. We've retraced pretty much 61.8% of that. We've dropped lower, and we, we have posted a little bit of a reversal down here. And currently, we're pushing up against this moving average here, which suggests if we do push higher, we could see euro dollar go lower. But ultimately, I think the picture has changed somewhat, and I think there's a good chance, and you can disagree with me if you like, and love it if you would, um, that we've probably bottomed in euro dollar. And I know that's slightly contrarian, given what's happening in Greece at the moment and the potential for a Greek default. But 
what we've seen in the past 24 hours is they've kicked it, they've kicked this so-called can, and I hate to use that cliche because the can is probably in bits by now, you know, at the time it's been kicked. <laughs> but it's been kicked another 20-odd days. So we've certainly got potential for an awful lot more volatility in euro dollar and potentially more upside. Now, this bottom that we've got around here is around about 114.80, 115 in euro dollar. So if we now basically drill this down into the actual euro dollar short-term chart that I've got here, I know it looks a bit of a mess. It does make sense to me, even if it doesn't make sense to anybody else. Let's actually get rid of that channel there because it's now surplus to requirements. So we've got a, I think we've got potential for a little bit of a pullback in euro dollar as long as we stay below this series of peaks um, either side of that very strong peak that we saw yesterday. If we look at that peak there, it's around about 112.85, 113. So in the event of a poor number at uh, 130, we could actually get a pull back to around about the 113 level. I don't expect for us to see a breakout of the current range. I certainly don't expect to see us break above 114.80, the May highs. There is a good chance in the event that we get a very positive number, we could take out yesterday's lows at around about 111.50. But I don't expect to take out this low around about 110.50 or this key level around about here. The oscillator is starting to point a little bit lower, but overall I think it's really a question of what happens if the number comes in as expected. I think we can continue to get choppiness between 112.85 and 111.80. If we get a very positive dollar number, we could see a strong move lower and a move down to these sorts of levels that we saw um, at the beginning of the week, just below just above 110, 110.50, 110 110.70. If we get a bad number, then again, we'll probably retest the highs that we saw um, yesterday. For me, it's all about picking the range. It's about picking your moment. At the moment, we're stuck in the middle of this range, and it's really reacting to the number as it comes out. So certainly in the context of euro dollar, and more importantly, I think the pound against the dollar, it's a similar sort of story. You've got a very strong trend line resistance coming in from the peaks that we saw in the middle of May. That currently comes in just above 154. So again, a poor dollar number, we could see a rally in the pound up to around about 154, but it would take something substantial to really drive it above there. So we really need to be aware of that going forward. Now, I know, Colin, I've rambled along enough. I know you want to talk about the Canada jobs numbers because they're out as well. Yes, so I guess I'd like to do I'll, Canada and the uh, S&P. Yeah. So, yeah, if you can. So I'll bring up the dollar Canada, Canada chart. So this is my okay, safe so dollar gone... Canada chart. Thanks, Michael. So I've gone a little bit more bullish on the uh, on my thinking on the employment numbers for the uh, United States. I felt I've I've been watching the jobless claims, and after the last month's survey, we saw a, a pretty significant drop to the lowest level we've seen in years and years, pretty much almost a century for uh, for jobless claims, even though they've since ticked back up a little bit. So I'm thinking we might see a little bit of an improvement on last month's number, which was 223, and I've gone with 240 for the U.S. For Canada, we had a, a substantial increase in full-time jobs last month that was overshadowed by a drop in part-time jobs. That's why you ended up with a, a negative headline number. This month, the street's looking for 10,000 overall. I think you'll see, for Canada, uh, full-time jobs retrench a little bit, say back to around 20, but I think you'll see the uh, the part-time bounce back. So the street's at 10,000, and I've been, uh, I put up my guess as uh, 25,000 for Canada employment this month. So with Canada, we've seen it uh, it's been quite choppy lately. We had the uh, it was generally strengthening between March and the middle of May for the uh, the loonie while the uh, price of oil uh, also recovered from 40 to 60. In the uh, with oil is leveled off, we've actually seen the uh, Canadian dollar weaken quite a bit. We've had the uh, the loonie go here from this 119 120 lows uh, back up to 125 where it's been bumping up against resistance again. We can see it's gotten overbought on the uh, 
on the stochastics and started to roll back down again. If it breaks that 80, would be a downward signal. So it is looking a little bit toppy here for a $4 cat that is probably weakened. It's certainly weakened more than you would have expected from the oil price. There has been some soft Canadian uh, data lately, that which is what's uh, which is what has pushed the loonie lower. But still, unless things really go off the rail, it doesn't look like the Bank of Canada is going to cut rates. They didn't do it at their last meeting and didn't really indicate any plans to do it either. So uh, on Canada, if we continue to see a positive uh, a plus number on jobs, particularly on full-time jobs, then uh, I think you'll probably see it, uh, it continue to uh, top out here in and around this uh, falling, uh, falling trend line. Certainly looking at that candle there, Colin, the negative one there, that, mm -hmm. that does seem to suggest that there's significant selling pressure there. Obviously, we do have falling lows, and we have had a strong rally off that trio of lows around about 119 and a half. So, yeah, you know, that negative tired now. It is looking a little bit tired. What we don't want to see, I think, is a, is a, is a break above that peak that we saw at the beginning of the month, which is, I think, just around about 125 and a half we can quickly have a look at that mm -hmm. uh, it's 125.65 give or take the odd pip so it's only worth keeping an eye on that if we blow that down um, it gives us a much better indication of um, the actual chart in question now you've actually got quite a nice little line going through there let's draw that in um, just attach it to those lows there that's actually quite nice, that, That's albeit it's very, very tight into the apex, so we may not get a significant reaction if we do break below it, but certainly I think there's good support around about 123.80 on the downside in the event that we get a good Canada number. Uh, you wanted to look at the S&P, didn't you? Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the S&P and, and where we're at in the uh, perspective. If you could uh, blow that up to a, uh, a daily chart, Michael. That is, oh, four hours, okay. It looks a little bit bottomy around about the lows that we saw earlier there. Let's look at a daily, there we go. Yeah. I just wanted to highlight here, and, and where we're kind of at in the, in the overall picture on this for U.S. stocks is that we're at a typical point, which was I, I call the mid-cycle correction, which is you get a, a liquidity-fueled rally up out of the bottom, then you get into a stage where they start pulling back on liquidity, and, and the market goes sideways. And we saw this in 04 and 05. We saw it again in... Um, 1994 and 1995, where the market basically goes sideways for a year because you lose the liquidity boost, and that kind of puts a cap on the stock market. But at the same time, the market only goes down so far because then it's supported by a generally improving economy and growing corporate earnings. And we've moved into this now, particularly since February, but in some ways you could almost chase it back to November and you had one little higher leg. We've basically been going sideways in the U.S. market, and, and a lot of people are getting confused by this, where you get a lot of conflicting data, where the market goes up for a couple couple of days and down for a couple of days and nobody can really get uh, get a handle on it and then uh, I, I've seen Twitter is full of reports of people saying oh it's all over oh watch out for the market crash that's coming and and, and so on and in reality the, you know, the the US economy is generally strengthening whether it's a little stronger than we think or a little softer but it's generally kind of muddling along reasonably well and, and that's where we're at with the market so usually these things last about nine to twelve months and if you say start in February and measure it for nine months you're about halfway through, and if you started in last November and measure it for a year, again, you're about halfway through this. So we could still see this kind of choppiness in the U.S. markets and this sideways trend trending for a um, through the summer and probably into the fall. So when we're looking at, at moves in the market, it still lends itself to a, a more of a trading approach where you where being opportunistic, trading off news, looking at how things happen relative to expectations is, is the key for, uh, for U.S. markets or, or really for the next several months. You carry on, mate. I'm just in the middle of trying to construct a chart on my Bloomberg. Oh, is sure, there anything no problem. else you want me to look at? So, uh, uh, no, this is a, this is good here. We um, we still got about three minutes until the uh, two and a half minutes until the payrolls come out. So what we're looking at. So of course, what we've really what we're really focusing in on here and with the employment numbers is at this point in time, people are focused more. What does this mean for the Fed? What is the Fed likely to do? And, and Michael talked a little bit earlier about inflation. And and the other thing we're watching for, and we've seen it crop up in uh, particularly in, in euro trading lately and elsewhere, is that there had been when we had the oil price crash, that uh, people were worried about the 
inflation and, and some of the headline numbers did go into the uh, it did go into the negatives. Now we're seeing the headline numbers are starting to bounce back a little bit as crude oil has bounced back. It's up. It's, it's at 60 instead of 40. And uh, but we've we've been still getting really mixed readings on the core inflation. Some of core inflation has been ticking up. But uh, for example, you talked about the U.S. and the the U.S. has a measure called core PCE, and that's the one that the Fed uses, and it's still been soft. So something I would be keeping an eye on as we're looking at the data here will be the uh, the average hourly earnings as well as the actual employment numbers because it's been holding above two percent for uh, for the last several months even while the uh, the jobs have been all over the place okay so um, what I've done this ties into my narrative of a stronger euro and a weaker dollar if we look at this chart here this is the spreaders this is the spread between the 10-year bund in the 10-year u.s treasury and we can see that the spread is tightening in favor of the bund which implies a stronger euro we've broken below this support here mm -hmm. if this continues to push lower then that should support euro dollar it's when basically the yields between the two come closer together we'll go into that a little bit more detail after the numbers come out but the numbers that i'm, I'm we're essentially looking for are the non-farm payrolls obviously um, looking at average hourly earnings, actually I need to call that up, so let me just bring that up, market calendar, and then we can, average hourly earnings is right there, so we'll just open that alert, it's right there, close the market calendar, and then drop them in there. So 10 seconds away, let's uh, bring up my Bloomberg, actually let's put it, let's put the Bloomberg up there. Then you can actually see the numbers as they come out. 280, cool, that's a good number. Ooh, wow. first lower euro dollar, that's a big one. Let's that look at the average US hourly earnings. Scream higher on that. Yeah, it should scream higher, above 125 on dollar yen, I would suggest. So let's just pull that out of the way. Oh, and quickly, Canada happened. jobs up 58k, 30,000 full time. So that's a huge number for Canada as well. Right. So the next level on dollar yen is 125.65, wow, which go. is basically the highs that we saw in early 2012, and we look as if we're blasting towards that. We've come back off that now. Let's look at euro dollar. Let's quickly move that out of the way. So they'll be they'll be screaming rate to rate hike now for June. But, I still um, think June is pushing think, it, but certainly no, maybe think, July or June, September. June, June's out of the picture because for me, they've got to they've got to upgrade their forecasts. So yeah, it looks like we're probably going to come back to here around about 110.50 on euro dollar. Uh, on the back of of that number, let's just dissect the rest of it. So we got 280 on the non farms. Um, we got. 5.5 on the unemployment rate. So unemployment's actually gone back up. That's interesting. Um, 62.9 on the participation rate. That's edged back up as well. And let's look at average hourly earnings. And they've gone up 0.3%, which is above expectations. And the yearly rate has gone up 2.3. So it's definitely dollar bullish, I think, if you basically broaden it out across all of them, even though the unemployment rate has increased, you can explain that away on the back of the fact that the participation rate has also gone higher as well. So that, that certainly introduces an extra element of volatility in it, and I certainly think that means that potentially we've probably seen the high in the euro for the short term, and we could have a little, another little trip towards the downside. So we've looked at, we've looked at euro dollar, as we can see, that the area of support I'm targeting there which is just below 111 dollar yen pretty much topped out where I thought it might 125.65 125.70 that was the that was the big big level if we can blow that out all the way back to 2002 we can actually see the number in question if I can actually uh, get it out out of the way that far I can I can show you how I arrived at that number if I can actually find it and there it is Right, it's, so it's not that one. It's those peaks there, and that's where we've peaked out. So it was around about between the end of October and November 2002. So that's basically why I picked that particular level on dollar yen uh, when the dollar shot higher. So we'll take that back in again there, and we can now uh, move to the. Let's look at the others. 
Guys, if there's anything you want me to, if there's anything else you want me to look at, please feel free to chip in. Look at, uh, not surprisingly, we've seen, obviously, U.S. equity markets drift lower on the back of that. And it brings the, tighten, it brings the tightening a little bit closer. It certainly makes Absolutely. you wonder I think. what the IMF were thinking when they uh, were uh, talking about potentially delaying a rate hike um, yesterday. Was it yesterday? Yeah. It was yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah. It was yesterday. I think that pretty much I, – I, I had done a presentation last night and told everybody I think that uh, that, that speech pretty much sealed the deal on a uh, on an interest rate hike this year, at least in December, because the uh, the Americans certainly don't like anybody telling them what to do. And uh, with the IMF track record, I don't think anybody wants to listen to them. Uh, fair enough, exactly. Or, Who does, right? I mean, nobody wants to see the IMF going around telling them what to do. She probably should have just stayed quiet on that. Well, or either that or had a little chat in Janet's show, like, on the quiet. In yeah, Aria. exactly. Um, I've just been asked about EuroCAD. I covered that in my video um, this week. I'll cover that in a minute. I'm just going to write that down. Um, we'll cover that in just a moment. What I would say is that these are an un unambiguously good set of numbers, but to my mind, they don't change the timeline of a prospective U.S. rate hike. And for me, it's about sequencing. Sequencing here is basically for June, if the U.S. want to raise rates in September, they need to adjust their growth forecasts up in June. I think we both talked about that, didn't we, Colin? They, yes, downgraded, their we... Growth, they downgraded their growth forecasts in March we, um, because of concerns about the slowdown in Q1. So if they're going to telegraph a rate hike, which I think they probably will, or, or lay the groundwork for one, then they'll need to upgrade their growth forecast in June to act in September. Given the weakness of the data that we've seen thus far, I think they're still unlikely to move their forecasts in June. And the next time they can do that is September. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. They do it every other meeting. Okay. Or every quarter. So yeah. basically, then... It's unlikely they'll raise in September. They'll probably raise their forecast in September, and that will be telegraphing that potentially we could see one in October mm -hmm. or December because there isn't one. Um, there isn't one in November. That's correct. It's it's pretty much right on Halloween and then and then mid December. Those I think are the two most likely uh, so the two most likely meetings for increases this year. And then the other one is are, are they going? What kind of a path do they want to take? Oh, they've still kind of been talking very cautiously. So they, it's possible they may go every other meeting this in, in, for rate hikes instead of every meeting as they have in the past. So we'll be keeping an eye on that as well. Hmm. I mean, people are talking about rate hikes. Do you think it's credible that they would hike rates before hiking their forecasts? At a minimum, I don't see them doing it off of a cut. I, when they when they cut in March, it pretty much rules that they because you can't cut your forecast and then start raising rates. Maybe you might sneak one in, in in September at the same time as an increase if they if they stay the same in June. If they raise in June, they're telegraphing a hike. If they uh, if they stay the same, it's it's iffy, but I would say probably no to July, maybe to September if they decide to do it at the same time. Mm. Now, I think call me when September ends. I mean, I think the IMF yeah, intervention... Yeah, to call us in August, back in August, yeah. I think the IMF intervention speaks to a wider concern they have about hiking rates. Right, let's go into EuroCAD, because we talked about mm -hmm. that earlier uh, this week in my weekly video, and... That's a, that's a nice little move down there, EuroCAD off, off the highs and off those peaks. The inverse head and shoulders that I talked about, the break higher. What we don't want to do here is fall back below the neckline of this potential head and shoulders. We can see from here and here and here and here how significant 137.80, the 137.80 level is in the context of this overall move. If we, if we ratchet out all the way to the 2014 highs, let's take that out there. We can see how significant also the 50-week moving average is. We've broken above the 200-week moving average. So what we don't want to do, I think, with respect to EuroCAD, is actually close back below the 200-week moving average. Um, we've broken above it. Um, we haven't as yet broken the downtrend line from the 2014 highs. What we really want to do is see a significant close above it. But in the short to medium term, 
if we do drift lower, what I wouldn't want to see is for us to close the week below the 200-week moving average. And I would be surprised if we did do that, even, even accounting for today's significant pullback that we're currently seeing in Euro Canada, a good Canada jobs number, and also um, obviously a very good US jobs number. So you've got, got a little bit of a double whammy there. Um, so that's what I think of EuroCAD. Um, as long as we stay above 137.80, then I still think that this breakout is as valid as it could be. And we all know that when you, me when you measure a breakout of an inverse head and shoulders, you measure the distance from the peak to the neckline and you project it higher. Well, there's around about 650 points between there and there. So as long as we can sustain this move higher, then we've got potential to go from 137.80 all the way to 143 or 144, which is the February, um, the February peaks that we saw earlier this year. Um, let's have a quick look at um, OPEC and Brent crude. I think that's um, strong dollar is obviously, I think, going to push uh, crude prices back down. We're pushing against a significant uptrend line and a couple of significant support areas on this daily Brent chart here. And we can see that borne out by these lows here, around about $61 a barrel. So that's a, that's a significant support area. So it's certainly worth keeping an eye on that if we decide that we're going to drift lower over the course of the next few hours. There we go. Nice little intersection on support there. We've got significant resistance coming in through the peaks from uh, the May highs. The Greystone Doji that I identified, I think, uh, last month is still holding true. We've managed to stay below that. And as such, I think this, this downtrend, if we break below this level here, we could start to see further traction in that. Similar sort of story on WTI. Please jump in, Colin, if you, if you want to add anything. Um, again, WTI is slightly different, I think, in that it's trading in a bit of a range. We had a similar a Greystone Doji. What we didn't get, though, is a slow breakout. What we've got here is a sideways consolidation. So if we take this channel here and then do that, that, I think, is the, the strength of WTI. Again, we've had a bit, a bit of a reversal there. But I think, again, we're probably going to drift down to the lower end of this reach, this recent range. Yeah, I think you're um, right on that, and even possibly back. I mean, over time, over the summer, you could even maybe see it come back. Uh, that, I believe the low end right now is around 55, and just below that, you've got that uh, resistance support line. What is that, around 53? I can't read that very well. The, the 50, sideways line you've got just below the bottom of the channel. Yeah, so you can see that retest again. We've, you've got. I think you'll. Uh, I think you're going to have a hard time seeing uh, WTI get much farther from uh, above where it is because you've had this. Uh, you've had uh, Saudi Arabia in particular walking around clucking, basically saying we getting uh, thumbing their nose at the Americans and saying we're winning the uh, the supply war and and we've pushed you out and we're going to keep production going on full tilt because we're winning and um, and I think if you saw the the prices get too much higher, you'd see the Amer a response from the Americans in bringing their production back on. So even though you're seeing the uh, the U.S. Uh, inventory starting to come back off, the um this supply with war among uh, suppliers and, and a lot of it's politically driven not just uh, not just economically driven I think and uh, and that you're going to see this go on for quite a while so uh, I, I suspect that what we'll see is the uh, WTI go uh, into some somewhat of a wider training range whether it's 50 to 60 or 55 to 65 mm -hmm. or, or something like that so probably not it, it, I, I also at the same time with the US economy strengthening I have a hard time seeing it going back to 40 in the near term but you'll probably see it level off now and kind of, a, you know, certainly nowhere near where it was a year ago, but uh, but well up off the bottoms as well. Yeah, I've just been asked to have a quick look at cable, quite happy to do that. Mm -hmm. um, key support there is around about 150, 170, that's the lows this week. I think what's also important about that is if we take it around to the dailies, we've got a convergence of the 50 and 100 day moving average, so that basically makes this level doubly important. 
in the context of where we could go next. So what I, won't, what I don't want to see, I think, in ca on cable on this daily chart is for us to fall below 150.160. Otherwise, we're probably going to head back to this sort of area around about 150 in the short to medium term. Certainly think the market's going to want to have a crack at the downside, certainly on the basis of those figures. I think an awful lot of people were caught the wrong way round. Uh, that's certainly borne out by our client sentiment here, where most of our top clients are actually position valued 76% long of cable. That's up 2% today. So that gives you an indication of how sentiment has changed over the course of the last few days. I can remember about Four or five, three or four weeks ago, when that was 93% short and only about 7% long. So you can see the cash position as opposed to the number of clients who are long or short. The actual amount of cash sitting along a cable is 76%, and that's our top clients. And the top clients are basically the clients who've made the most money over the last three months. I find that's an incredibly useful indicator in terms of where the market could well head to next. And the pound has actually been fairly resilient over the course of the last few months, simply on, on, on the basis of that some of the, most of the economic data has been fairly positive. Um, we have seen a little bit of a sell-off since we peaked around about 158 um, uh, in the, in the, at the end of May, middle of end of May. But overall, um, we're getting we're getting some positive signs on the moving averages. We did briefly break above the 200-day moving average. That's still pointing down. So that suggests to me that with the 50 and the 100 coming up to meet the 200, we're probably going to have to get used to a little bit of sideways consolidation, probably between 150 and 158, so we get a bit of a flattening effect on the 200. Um, Euro sterling, need to have a quick look at that. That's in a range. I mean, that's really... That's pretty dull at the moment, as we can see from this chart here. We can see that there's significant support around about the low 70s um, and the significant areas of resistance between 73.80 and 74. You can see those two peaks the end of March, beginning of April. We've seen it again yesterday. We've had a bit of a pullback. Looking for it to find support around about 72.10, there or there about 72.20. Um, certainly around those lows um, that we saw um, at the beginning of the week. Sometimes when I look at a four-hour chart, you can see where the areas of congestion, support and resistance are just by drawing straightforward horizontal lines. Try not to overcomplicate it too much. We can see that through there with these peaks and the troughs, how they reverse their roles all the way through there and there. That actually works even better if I extend it backwards to the left. Um, it probably hasn't worked as well um, in April, but in May, the 72, 72 figure, 7220 area has actually worked quite well as support and resistance in equal measure. We can see there's a series of um, support levels around about 7250, so certainly be keeping an eye on that over the course of the next few trading sessions. So we've looked at Brent, we've looked at, um, let's have a quick look at the DAX, because I think the DAX is actually quite interesting. This, was, this, is, another, this is another area that uh, I was looking at um, the other week. We've got, again, lower highs, lower lows. We're on a key support area around about 11, 11,166. But what was also particularly interesting when I, when I did a video a few months ago was the fact that um, we got a significant uh, sell-off here in the Germany 30 and all the DAX, and it also mirrored. And this is why I'm a little bit um, I'm a little bit bullish on the euro, not overly, because it's going to take it's going to need deep pockets to actually stay in. If we look at the Bund, had a nice little breakout on the flag there. You can see how volatile it's been. But if you look at the monthly chart. Let's bring that all the way out. I mean, look at that. I mean, that is a significant bearish monthly reversal. Now, we have seen an awful lot of volatility, so yields could come all the way back to 0.5%. That's when we ticked and hit 1% yesterday on the Bund. But certainly in terms of spread differentials, we can certainly see that that Bund rally that we saw that saw yields hit 0.05% earlier this year was well overextended. 
these lows that we saw in 2014 equate to a yield of around about just over 2%. So at the beginning of 2014, German 10-year was yielding 2%. It's now obviously a lot lower than that. It's below 1%. But for me, I think the direction of travel is quite clear. We've held above this 50% level, and I think we're going to chop between 38.2 and 50%. Certainly, Mr. Draghi says we're going to get, have to get used to yield volatility and bund volatility. Well, I think we probably are going to see quite a lot of it, and that's going to pull euro dollar around an awful lot over the course of the next few days and months. And I think that's really why you're going to have to, it's very important that you pick your moment when you try and get into a euro dollar trade dollar's very very bullish at the moment you wouldn't want to stand in the way of it but i certainly think that uh, that 11050 11080 level is still a very very key level in the context of um this line that i've drawn in through these levels here so I think if we drop below 110.50, then we could see further losses back to the lows at 108.80, which we saw well, at 108.50, which we saw in May. Does anyone else have any questions on any of what Colin and I have just covered? If not, um, you can, and if you missed any of it, you can listen to it back because we'll post it on YouTube, as we normally do in the next 24 hours. Otherwise, ladies and gentlemen. Colin and I would like to thank you for your attendance this month and um, we'll see you same time, same place next month for the same non-farm payrolls. Also, um, we have a monthly webinar in the middle of May. The details are in the education section of our website where we'll basically talk over the events of the last two to three weeks and also generally kick about any chart, particular chart patterns that, are, uh, that we find of interest. Sounds fantastic. Thanks everyone for joining us today. It's been a uh, it's been quite an active uh, market on the uh, on the numbers, and and we expect to see it continued markets continue to be active throughout the day. So it looks like another big day for trading. Cool. All right. Thanks, ladies and gents. Until next month, or in a couple of weeks' time, when we do the monthly monthly Q and A um, on Thursday. I think it's the is it the fifteenth? No, it's not. Eleventh, eighteenth. I think it's the 18th. All right, thanks, guys. Thanks. See you then.